a it's a sort of a classic immigrant story coming from India um, to Canada. Um, I felt like I lost all of my family and friends when I left, and those photos and those stories are what I could still hold on to that made me, you know, still understand my place in the world. And uh, so they took on this added power, and I realized that that power holds true for everyone. time to do that right <laughs> yeah okay we're recording this is another episode of the automate and grow podcast my guest today is the infamous indrani and i think you are the first person to have only one name on the show yay <laughs> <laughs> now indrani is very well known as a documentary filmmaker is that a good way to describe it or a uh, filmmaker in general filmmaker. documentaries and scripted and commercials and music videos and Everything you just described, I was going through your online site, and it's kind of crazy, the portfolio stuff you have. So first of all, I'm very excited that you joined me. I appreciate you taking the time. I'm really glad to be here with you. Okay, we have only one thing in common, I think. <laughs> We're both Canadian. <laughs> okay, that's a good thing. But we both escaped to the States. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing right no, now. I don't but... know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I guess when you got, what you were really well known for when you were younger was what? Because I think you've kind of changed or evolved your career over time, right? So I started um, out as a fashion model and a, a model actor um, because I was really interested in photography and filmmaking, but uh, I went to a bunch of studios and asked if I could intern and they laughed at me and said, you're a girl, you're Indian, like, no. But um, but you can sit here and we'll take a picture of you and you can you know you can learn something that way. So I thought, great, this is a a sweet deal. I get to sit in the center of the action and observe everything. And uh, so that's that's how I got my start in photography and filmmaking. So it's such an odd thing because it's like your motivation for modeling was to take pictures. Yes, and and to tell stories. I I was a it's a sort of a classic immigrant story coming from India. Um, to Canada, um, I felt like I lost all of my family and friends when I left, and those photos and those stories are what I could still hold on to that made me, you know, still understand my place in the world. And uh, so they took on this added power, and I realized that that power holds true for everyone. So just you know, not to soft shoe it, but you have some pretty. I would say pretty impressive work in your photography portfolio. <laughs> so the the one that I think really that I love is the maybe some of the more current stuff, but with David Bowie. Well, thank you. Yeah, so I think that was like an instrumental in you getting started, or that was one of the big things that really kind of launched. That's right. Yeah, I I um, after modeling and uh, acting, I went to Princeton. Uh, well, before that, I started a school in India. That was my side passion but anyway <laughs> and then I went to Princeton um and uh and the whole while I was doing my own photography on the side and getting it published in underground magazines um and David Bowie happened to come across some of the work uh he was actually with Iman his wife they were looking for someone to photograph her book cover um Iman is one of the greatest supermodels of all time right. and she's been photographed by everyone and uh, had rejected the other attempts at uh, covers that other really famous photographers had made. So, uh, so when uh, Bowie called called up at uh, my studio and uh, said, "Hey, I've been a fan of your work for a while," it was that was very shocking. And, uh, and he asked me to to photograph this cover that was, um, you know, had already been uh, <laughs> attempted a few times. So, uh, oh, really, so, so they kind of gone through some failed other collaborations with photographers that's right yeah oh, so i've most of my best opportunities have been uh, where others have failed and where the clients have run out of money tried out all their ideas and then they say oh well let's try someone else and see what they can do and so uh, so and that's often that your first out. chance right <laughs> sorry and look how that turned out <laughs> right exactly yeah it worked out really well um we did uh we had a great uh a great time on the shoot and um and then David said, I'm working on an album. Uh, I'll let you know when it's done because you know, maybe you can do the album cover. Like, Great. 
didn't hear from him for another six months. And I thought, well, that's just what the kind of things people say. Right. And then got another call out of the blue saying, hey, what are you up to? Do you want to come and listen to some music? Let me know what you think about it. So I uh, went over to his studio 15 minutes later, listening to him playing. And, and then I had to admit that I really didn't know much about his music. And I had never oh, really no. listened to it before. <laughs> Did you like that? Was that like, oh, good, finally? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, it was it was interesting for him. I think he he always enjoyed uh, enjoyed people that were not, um, you know, the expected people that were out of the ordinary in one way or another. And so my very sh sh uh, sheltered childhood um, in India certainly gave me a different perspective. That is so interesting. So it's like accidentally, you know. First of all, what is it like when David Bowie calls you? Do you believe that it's David Bowie or was it a representative? <laughs> I, I was sure that it was it was some kind of joke. But he was amazing and he he ended up being a mentor to me for uh, for over a decade. I worked with him many times. And the last time uh, he actually launched my directing career after launching my photography career, um, he gave me my first major music video opportunity for what turned out to be the last... Um, the last really song that he released during his lifetime, which is called oh, Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. So Valentine's Day, that was a video that you directed. Yes, that's right. And it was about a high school mass shooting, which is um, at the time hadn't yet become the massive phenomenon of uh, social phenomenon that it's become now. So he was really looking ahead and um, seeing the trends uh, as they began and uh, wanted to wanted to address, um, you know, uh, his perspective, to look into the mind of, of a mass shooter and address the idea of, um, you know, that he might have, you know, he was sort of looking at his own perspective and if he hadn't become an artist, you know, how would he have expressed himself with uh, the angst and those things? So it was a really interesting way of looking. That, that is, I mean, that takes a special person to kind of look from that perspective, right? To yeah. Go spot and that probably yeah. explains why it was such like, a, it touches a nerve when you listen to it, right? Like you're like kind of, yeah. like you can feel that he's really thought this through and is empathizing in a sense, not empathizing in a positive way, but like understanding what was going on. Yeah, yeah, I think he really wanted to encourage people to to look deeper than the surface, to look at what motivates these um, these young people to do these terrible things, and uh, and I think that's a part of the conversation that tends to um, tends to not be explored. People often look at the victims, or they look at um, you know they look at these individuals as monsters, and they miss the human factor that leads them to become those monsters. Wow, that is crazy. Okay. <laughs> well, like, what a perspective. So, I mean, beyond that, do you mind if I share my screen for a second and just show sure. some stuff you've done? Yeah. This is definitely something I haven't done, but I think it's totally to get perspective on, you can see my, probably my backgrounds, Star Wars. But, <laughs> <laughs> but these are some of the, you know, more famous works, but probably, I don't know if these are some of your favorite, like, are there any that kind of jump out at you? Like, this, I mean, his, he was such an icon. I think you captured that. Like, it was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he really, he really was a, just an extraordinary human being and, and filled with so much, uh, such a strong urge to constantly challenge not only himself, but uh, you know, the world's perspective on, on things. And I think that's, a, that, that's what a true artist does. Um, very, you know, some pretty other prolific people here. You, now, this is one that I find image-wise is very striking, but I, I don't think I'm aware of who Eugene Braybrock is. So he's he's a, the he's a star of Wonder Woman. He plays Chief oh. in in that film, and he's oh, um, he right. is the first Native American to play a superhero. So oh. he was he was really fun to to shoot with, and just an extraordinary human being. Yeah, I mean these are incredible, of course. Thank you. That's Lady Gaga in the middle, of course, and Beyonce. I, so I helped launch both Beyonce's solo career and Lady Gaga's solo career with the album art for their debut albums. I mean, look, it's like incredible. Like, how old was she there? Like, in, like twenty something? Like, early oh 20? yeah, yeah. She was very, very young. And then Kate Winslet, of course. So I mean, yeah. you've, been, you've this one is the one that's bizarre to me, actually. And this one, these two look totally like not even the same people that they are now, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, there's always a little magic that goes into every photo, but yeah. um, but Kim was Kim was a just an extraordinary woman. She's a really a very intelligent and complex, even though she doesn't necessarily play that character on TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, they've, they've certainly gained the attention and turned it into a career, right? Based on yeah. just attention alone, like probably pioneers in this modern reality slash social age, right? Yeah, absolutely. So she can't be, I mean, her mom's definitely smart and I I don't oh, get the impression. No, she's, she's, she's brilliant. She's brilliant. And now she's, she's studying to be a lawyer and she's taking on the criminal justice system. So. I saw that. That's really interesting. I and mean, very timely considering a lot of the crazy stuff that's going on right now and people are dealing yeah, with it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So I won't, I won't belabor that. I don't know if this, if this is good for you or not, but I love what, looking at your portfolio. So. Well, so much of what I've done has been in, in branding and marketing, you know, creating the image for these artists, for these brands, for ideas, for nonprofits. Um, so I think that that, you know, that might be a place where um, where everyone now has to, to think about imaging and branding for themselves. And so um, so while I've been focused on the, the visual side of that in my earlier career as a photographer now as a, as a filmmaker, um, directing commercials and uh, and looking more on the strategic development of brands as well. Um, I found there's there's so many commonalities between launching you know, whatever it is you're launching or, or continuing to grow any kind of, of branding, whether you're an artist or a nonprofit or a tech company, it all comes down to the same piece. I mean, it sounds like you, so to shift gears, obviously, you started moving more into filmmaking. Are you, you still don't, you're not right. really into photography anymore. So, and you I do both. I do both. But, uh, but my passion is, is telling stories of transformation. And uh, those are, better you know easier achieved in in moving images than in stills is this janelle monet is that who that is yes it is okay yeah. interesting wow you got so many great pieces it's i could just keep staring at it but <laughs> i don't want to embarrass you well thank you <laughs> so uh, i guess from so when did you start moving more into film or were you always kind of involved in film and then what's the stuff now that you're interested in working on or are working on so i moved into film about 10 years ago um, well, I started with music videos and commercials, but my passion was always longer form storytelling. Um, but commercials are a wonderful uh, testing ground and a place to really develop expertise. Because if you can tell a story in 30 seconds, then you can really tell something fantastic when you have a whole hour of someone's time. But telling it in that short amount of time is the key because really being able to boil it down. So, um, so I created a short film, I directed. Um, called Girl Epidemic, which won the CNN uh, Expose Best Picture Award in 2018. And then I also won the Tribeca Film Festival Awards. Um, and that was a film on trafficking, which is something I'm very passionate about. And it's a really, really difficult topic to share with people in a way that they are interested to help. Because what tends to happen is people watch documentaries, they're horrible, and people go home and say, oh, my God. I don't want to ever think about this again because it's just dreadful. Yeah. But um, and a lot of, very important, obviously. But it yeah. is. It is very important. But the, the problem is that uh, the people who tend to go to see those kinds of documentaries typically already know about the issue and care about it deeply. And so they've probably done all that they're going to do. And a lot of times they actually feel like they're doing something by watching the movie as opposed to taking that two hours time and using it to call their government representatives or do you know whatever they could do to actually impact the cause. So and that's something that I've come to realize is there's a great value in short form. And that's why I did this one minute piece, which gets people thinking and asking questions. And it's easy for people to share, um, but doesn't let them feel off the hook at the end of it. <laughs> you know, now, you know, you have to do something. I never something. thought of that. Cause I guess you're not like immersed in it for a long period of time. And then to your point, you don't, you know, people don't necessarily have that exhaustion of, oh man, I've kind of absorbed this. Yeah. So what you're yeah. saying is like the shorter stuff can get people to take action a little bit. Like you can use it. It in can. Way, right? It can. So that's been my strategy. And then paired with that, I'm now working on two feature films. One of them is a film on trafficking. Um, and that one is in a thriller style. It's scripted. 
it's it's a love story so it's like a uh you know like a hunger games kind of storytelling style it's it's dynamic it's engaging it involves the potential for you know terror and death which uh you know she certainly people involved in trafficking are, are in a, in a horrific situation but it's told in a way that people can can be entertained and can engage with the material and um and want to do more to help because ultimately it is an uplifting story and um just like most of our adventure stories the 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 challenges are huge but the payoff is really great so instead of being based on another the world or you know the way a lot of our storytelling is this is based in the realities of trafficking today in America a high school girl just like anyone else who happens to fall for the wrong guy so do you 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 don't write also do you typically produce like make films with other people's material or how do you come like yeah usually kind of... i mean the, the short films i've written myself okay. but i don't um my passion is is as a director um i've also produced some of the short films i've also been a dir director of photography so i will wear whatever hats are needed especially for nonprofit work but uh, my main role is as a director but that means i work with the writer um to help the script to evolve in the best possible directions and, and i'm very hands on so um without going too in depth what is the key to a great story oh uh, the key is capturing people's imagination, really immersing them in a world and then having a, a challenge that the protagonist faces that uh, that has really interesting stakes. You know, there has to be risk and there has to be a challenge that we can um, can really care about. And ultimately there, there are met so many different kinds of stories, but they, they tend to follow a, a certain structure um, and I like to mess with that a little bit. I like to mess right. with people's expectations, and I like to to highlight the our human capacity for transformation. And I think all great stories are actually stories of change. And uh, and as we watch our hero transform, it reminds us of our own potential to transform. And that's that's why we're so engaged in in watching content of you know, all kinds. We we want to be inspired and. So for me, it's all about finding ways to inspire people to be their best selves. So who's kind of your, I don't know if mentor, I know we talked about David Bowie, but in filmmaking or in any, anything else, who inspires you? There are so many people. Um, actually, I'm really inspired by Bessie Coleman, who is a, was an African-American woman in the 1920s. Um, it's another film that I'm working on. Um, is about her life and it's it's so exciting because she started off with absolutely nothing she was a, a sharecropper in Texas and decided that she wanted to fly airplanes and everyone told her she was crazy at the time it was the newest technology so it was the coolest thing to do and people were completely convinced that African Americans did not have the mental capacity and, not, and women didn't have the capacity. So no flight schools in America would take either women oh, wow. or black. So she traveled the country trying to find one that would take her and she saved up a whole bunch of money working all kinds of different jobs. And, um, and she didn't have a degree, um, but what she did is she became the best manicurist anyone had ever seen in Chicago, because that's <laughs> the only job she could get. But wow. she decided she would do the best anyone had ever seen. And through that, everyone who was anyone came to visit her to get their manicures done. And she made friends with all the movers and shakers of her time. And they all supported her dream. And um, she learned French. She saved up a bunch of money, moved to France, where she learned how to fly, because there they were a lot less racist and sure. sexist. And she came back as a national hero. And she used her fame and her air shows to actually overcome the uh, the race riots and the, the huge uh, racial divisions that the country was experiencing at the time. So she helped by bringing these massive audiences together that were of all races. And, and what time period did you say that was? When In was the 1920s. 20s. Okay. Wow. I mean, it's kind of scary. It's 100 years ago. <laughs> it is, and like it's like crazy that we are. Over. Yeah, <laughs> and we think this is the first time, but this is not. We that things were oh, really, gosh. really bad then. In fact. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma was bombed from airplanes uh, by the cops 
so at the time so you know this police brutality story has gone on for a long time yeah and obviously you're referencing the crazy stuff that's going on right now and it yes. sounds like uh well we won't get too much into it because i'm sure a lot of other people deal with it but it sounds like there's been at least some action in yeah that case right with the yeah which is exciting to see that development I think. probably with I the mean, pressure right <laughs> they had to do the right yeah. thing because <laughs> i mean yeah. there's a pretty clear-cut case where yeah all should be charged and going to jail or something <laughs> i think pretty much everyone pretty can hard. agree on that and and yet it, it took all this time it really didn't you know it didn't need to take this long to to make that call you know weird yeah. so but many others have been arrested in the meantime but not those the protagonists so. yeah exactly <laughs> well thankfully they upgraded the charges and they i think they charged the other guys right so that's good yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay a couple of things one if you were the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with do you and Johnny spend the most time with well i spend most of my time with my computer so i guess i've become a, a cyborg <laughs> well that's funny you say that aren't we all <laughs> yeah i think we are um i also spend time meditating every day so okay. i so i would i guess uh, be part of the spiritual world hopefully um the characters that inhabit it and i i really enjoy reading as well um, so you know, i think we can be part of people from other times in other worlds um so uh, by any chance have you ever did you see any of the interviews with elon musk on Neuralink? i i haven't seen those specific ones i have seen some of his interviews though. well that one very specific because he has a company i don't know if you are aware of called Neuralink, and they're putting basically starting with p brain injury patients putting mm. essentially a chip in the brain and then it maps their uh, cortexes and even you know the, the nervous system to repair brain injuries and they think that they can do a whole bunch of crazy stuff but the next logical application is that you know you don't have to have a brain injury to use this mm -hmm. and then if you if you notice if you gotta watch the interview on joe rogan it's kind of crazy I will. he um it talks most of the time about that and in particular, he says, listen, you're practically a cyborg already because you've got your phone and your computer. He goes, why, why don't we just put it inside? <laughs> yeah, well, we've outsourced so much of our you know, memory capacity and we've increased it so much. Right. But at the same time, that's also why this whole, uh, in, you know, the, the importance of who we can trust for our information um, in a time when the media has become really disenfranchised in so many ways. Um, you know, filmmakers and and professional storytellers, musicians, artists um, are really the biggest influencers in our times, and and I think that there is there's a huge amount of power in controlling the narrative. So so many of our politicians have recognized that as well. Where it doesn't, you know, that the objective truth of the matter is less important now it seems than the ability to spin a story that people uh find compelling so that's true right it's, yeah it's um you know the gotchas and the negative algorithm of everything yeah <laughs> is, is by design because you know the reality is people think we're supposed to be happy but the truth is that our bodies and brains we have like somebody i'm trying to think of who said the quote i've said it before which is we have uh Paleolithic emotions and godlike technology. <laughs> so we're well, dealing with like, the super advanced tech capabilities. It's only going to get, you know, it's only going to exponentially grow more in the next 10 years. And I think his reasoning too, which is interesting to go back to that, is that you have a you have an interface issue, which is the computer is now getting really smart and with AI, it wants to have a conversation. The problem is talking to you at some point is like talking to a tree. And that's what his analogy was. <laughs> so he goes, but if I, if I just make it so you don't need to type and you don't need to talk, there's no more interface issue. It's, it sounds fantastic. I'll, I'll sign up for, I'll be a guinea pig. <laughs> I just thought it was, it's an interesting 
thing to explore because you mentioned the cyborg thing so i can erase it <laughs> well so, so much of the work i do is about transformation and you know right. that idea of you know, your higher self what does that actually mean when our technology allows us to enhance ourselves potentially and, and without even realizing it? I mean, so much of of the tools that we use are changing the way our, our brains work and changing our capacity as individuals you know it is a very exciting time because I think one of the interesting things about this whole um, the current uh, protests is how non-advanced uh, tech they are. I mean, it's you know, people running around in the streets waving signs, and in a way, it's it's sort of reminding us of our physicality, which I think we so often forget. And as we live in the social media world, it's sort of a cognitive shock of like, wow, there's people banging on things outside my window, you know, when you've just been in this whole coronavirus time where everyone's just lived so virtually. So I think we have to engage in human interactions and find our find a balance between between uh, the tools and and allowing ourselves uh, to thrive emotionally and not being afraid of of the society and afraid of the forces that that are supposed to represent us. I feel like there's some really compelling stories for you in the future there. I also feel we're at a weird point where, you know, we're talking about the capacity and the physicality of our bodies. And I think then there's guys that are out there trying to transcend that. And yeah. you know, it's like you're a meditator. So how long have you meditated by the way, out of curiosity? Oh, since, since I was 19, oh, 18, great. 18. Yeah. So a long time. <laughs> Did somebody introduce you to that or you were just interested in it? Oh, well, when I did my modeling, acting, um, traveling around the world, I uh, I was really interested in, in exploring uh, spirituality. And so I, sp I spoke to monks and religious people around the world, wherever I went, and uh, ultimately ended up in England at an, at an ashram um, wow. where I, I just discovered, and, and it was just the most beautiful experience of my my life, I spent many weeks there uh, exploring inwardly. Was when, you know, having explored externally and discovered all of the possibilities of the physical, um, I, I wanted to, to go in, internally and see uh, what I could find. And I, I found that really empowering. And, um, and then I went to India and started my school there and uh, had all of those experiences that kind of reinforced uh, what I had realized, which is that we all are infinitely powerful we have so much capacity that we don't recognize and it's only by doing that we discover what we're capable of yeah and so that's really interesting to hear of how you came to it and I, I think it's like a secret of a lot of first of all very creative people and then also which is also a form of creativity a lot of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and it's almost again an effort to overcome the limitations of the shell we get and the you know yeah. reptile brain right <laughs> totally. so i find it interesting because i think it's all part of this effort almost to like how do we get past because it really and you mentioned it before like our brains we're outsourcing the memory but we have a very inefficient storage system yes it recalls stuff randomly and it, you forget you know like just the ability to forget automatically right it just kind of messes it up well, it's so interesting because, you know, with the title of this show, automating, you know, so much of meditating is increasing your mental capacities, using those muscles and, and growing their capabilities and making making your brain work for you instead of, you know, being a slave to your emotions, which tend to disrupt your mental capacities. So in a way, it's uh, it, it does become a process of, you know, when you repeat a mantra, it is literally an, an automating process of cutting through the noise and getting your brain to work for you and to do the things you want it to instead of what it feels like doing. Right. <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. So yeah. it's definitely uh, I, I think um you know we we are equipped with the most powerful computer that we've still ever encountered. Nothing we've ever managed to make rivals the human mind. So meditating is a way to, to utilize it to its to its best. I love it. I love that perspective. And I think that, um, again, it's it's something that we're trying to deal with distraction. And that's a tool that I find is very effective anyway. And I'm glad yeah. to hear that you're, you find the same thing. So um, listen, I want to be conscious of your time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I will 
ask is, let's see, I forgot to edit this part out. <laughs> My brain's like fried for the day. <laughs> um, okay, so how are you and Drani changing the world? Oh, well, I have a lot of projects that I'm working on. Um, fighting trafficking for me is number one because we have all the tools and we have the, everyone agrees that trafficking is bad. It's not a, you know, there are many other issues that I care about, but most of those involve competing opinions. Um, as far as trafficking goes, everyone will say children should not be sex slaves. Women should not be enslaved. No one should be enslaved. Uh, and yet we are not utilizing our resources to stop this. It's become one of the most lucrative businesses in the world. And it involves people on all levels of society. So it's, um, it's very important that we all do our part to stop it because I think it's just because we don't see it and we don't want to see it. So letting people have the awareness that it is in your own backyard and just because you haven't personally seen it doesn't mean you're not responsible in some way to take care of the kids in the world that are around you. So that's my top priority, but um, there are many other projects. I'm also working on fighting global warming. That's very important to me, sustainability and climate change. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm working with some exciting new technologies, nanotechnology companies. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, that are they're finding innovative ways to create batteries for uh, hmm. mass consumer vehicles. So I'm working with a company called Bodhi that is just doing extraordinary work in that area. And so as a creator, I've come to realize that um, we can't just tell stories. Sometimes you have to jump in and, and help to, um, to make the, the stories come true. Wow. So first of all, I want to acknowledge you for not only, you know, all of your creative work, but just the purposeful work that you're doing, particularly in the trafficking area and using your art to bring awareness to it and hopefully create change in the world. So I want to thank you for that thank and acknowledge you. you. Um, the final thing that I will wrap up with is actually, before I do that is, uh, do you want people to get in touch with you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, my website is indrani.com. Um, and I am on all social medias indrani PC. So that's I N D R A N I P C. Um, so I'd love to, to hear from you. Wonderful. I figured I'd check first cause you might be really popular. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the final thing is when we have interesting people on the podcast, we like you to nominate other interesting people. We typically talk to experts and entrepreneurs, uh, but as you can see, it's not always the case. So um, who would you and Johnny like to automate or not automate, but nominate <laughs> the future guest of the Automate Your podcast? Oh boy, there's some wonderful people. Um, I will get back to you on that. Oh, you can't cop out. You, who's the first person? No, really? Okay, okay, okay. So, um, gee, uh, man, there's so many great people. Um, what, would, what would the first person that pops in your head be? Uh, well, I, I'd love to nominate um, Wes Powell. Okay. Wesley Powell. Um, he is doing really innovative work in tech across the board in many different areas. Um, I'd nominate Kathy Ann Powell as well. Uh, she is doing great work in fighting trafficking, oh. um, us using interesting technology and, uh, and other approaches. So wonderful. Those two would be great. Those are great nominations. So Wes, and is it Katya or? Kathy Ann. Kathy Ann, Ann. sorry, I Ann cut out Powell. for a sec. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Wes and Kathy Ann, you've been nominated by Andrani to be a guest on the podcast of Automate and Grow. Andrani, thank you so much for joining me. I'm, I don't know if this is the normal thing you do, but I really appreciate your perspective on things and I love the work you're doing. Thank you so much. It's, it's really fun talking to you and I, I look forward to continued conversations. Anytime, like we can happy to chat. This has been another episode of the Automate Grow podcast. We will see you on a future episode, hopefully with Wes and Kathy Ann. I probably said her name wrong. Kathy Ann, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm famous for butchering everybody's name. So, <laughs> well, good to see you. Thanks. Have a great, great week.